the agenda is the meeting minutes and the approval letters. Oh, I'd like to make a motion to approve both with a correction um, on the uh, first paragraph of the minutes. Second sentence, I believe, after listening to the recording needs to be struck so that the sentence just begins with that motion was made by. So that's the motion. There's a second on the motion. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of the motion say aye. Aye. Any opposed? None. We'll have to abstain, Mr. Chairman. Okay. I wanted to hear last time. So the minutes and the approval letters have been approved. Minutes with the correction that was stated earlier. All right, let's move on to the first matter on the agenda. Um, 2135 Antioch Pike is the applicant here. Wonderful. You want to come up? I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. Did you approve both the minutes and the decision letters? Okay. Yes. Um, and then if you could read the opening statement. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> Terry's? Yeah, I answer. I probably nodded instead of talking. Yes, yes, both are approved. <laughs> All right, the opening statement to the applicant. If you are not satisfied with a decision made by the Stormwater Management Committee, you may appeal the decision by filing for a writ of certiorari with the Davidson County Chancery or Circuit Court. Your appeal must be filed within 60 days of the date of the committee's decision. You are advised to seek the independent advice of legal counsel to ensure that your appeal is filed in a timely manner and that all procedural requirements have been satisfied. Thank you, and with that, we'll open, oh, with that, we need a short explanation of the request from staff. The first case on the agenda is case number 2018-00034-2135 Antioch Pike, located at 2135 Antioch Pike. APN is 148-00004400. Inspector is Logan Bowman. Council District 28, Tanaka Vercher. Case was previously requested for deferral on January 3rd, 2019 and February 7th, 2019, before being presented to the Stormwater Management Committee to allow the following. Allowance of unpermitted gravel, an unpermitted carport, and unpermitted wood planking to remain in the buffer. Number two, continuous mowing and maintenance of the buffer area and waiver of buffer signage. Applicant's request is to allow the following. Um, the same things that, that were just stated. Appellant is Hare Rashad, Music City Auto, represented by Chet Rhodes, Rhodes Engineering and Environmental Services. Comments, Stormwater staff had no comment, codes, no comment provided. Planning, site is on CS, defer to Stormwater for review. Greenways, the 2016 Greenways Master Plan, play to play, calls for Greenway corridors on both sides of Mill Creek. Metro Greenways requests a Greenway conservation easement encompassing the floodway, plus an additional 75 feet running parallel to the floodway. Thank you. With that, we'll um, open the floor to the applicant. I did want to mention uh, he's. Well, one, one thing, commitment to working with the staff, and uh, we met several times the staff to get the maps and the drawings correct in the existing condition before we did the proposal. So as far as we know, we're complying with uh, the drawing submittals to match what the staff asked us to show, and the request seems uh, accurate what the staff has mentioned. So uh, I do want to thank Hare for his service and my dad died in Vietnam when I was four, and he served in the Big Red One, and I was at his office working with him. Noticed his picture with the Big Red One on the wall, and, and I wanted to thank him publicly for his service, and, and uh, we do want to help him any way we can, so we'll answer questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. My name is Jamie Hall, and here, here on behalf of the applicant. Uh, before we get started, kind of a brief history of the site. I think it's important to provide some context. When the lot was purchased by the applicant, it was previously used as a used car lot, such that the use has never changed 
when he got on the side of the property, there was a horrible amount of community dumping material, uh, gravel, bedding, you name it, all along the back of the property, including in Mill Creek. Mr. Muhammad then, when he came on the site, he wound up filling 18 containers full of trash and debris, not only off the property, but out of the creek to, to, the, to the expense of about $26,000. And to keep this from occurring in the future, he built a fence along the rear of the property to keep people from dumping in the creek. Uh, the gravel that's mentioned in the variance, it was on the site at the time of the purchase. Mr. Muhammad did not add gravel. He asked the previous owner about it, and said that was just from where people came, maybe with odd and in household jobs, left gravel and poured it. He did spread it around, because it was just piled up. Uh, it's, in addition, there's a, a carport on the back of the property in the buffer and Mr. Muhammad is willing and able and happy to move that. The planking is part of a flooring that's under a temporary carport or a temporary structure, also a carport. And a, it's a 15, 30, 15 by 30 foot size carport, but less than about five feet or of the planking, excuse me, uh, less than about 10 square feet of the planking is actually in the buffer, and we had asked to be allowed to keep that if possible. And again, I believe that's a temporary structure. And if Mr. Muhammad, if you have any comments you'd like to make. Yeah, if you, if you want to get go closer those, to that microphone. That's the planking that, that, sorry. Scoot that way. That's the planking that uh, Mr. Holland talking about. Um, now we use it, we just put the tires on it, and behind that, that shade in the back of it, that's how it's still like that, is not covered or enclosed, and less than 100 square foot of that ha is within the buffer. Um, if you scroll through the uh, pictures, I will uh, all explain so all the committee will see what I'm talking. This is the uh, unpermitted um, carport that I'm willing to move and um, to the to the other side of the lot and um, scroll one more time if you don't mind go that's the gravel it is actually not the real gravel it's just that the breeze i believe from the roofing of the old structures or buildings that people has actually uh, dumped there and uh, that's according to the previous owner he was not aware of it just like the other um, mattresses couches trees and you name it, tires. It was all over the Mill Creek siding and all that. Um, and I had to spend a lot of money actually to, to remove it, which is, is, is my duty. It was not a, it was just bothering me to see all that. From 2012, that dealer closed down all the way to 2018, July 2018, when we uh, basically bought that property. There was there was a lot of uh, trash and debris in that area. And, um, and that's the um, structure that has a, uh, within, uh, I think is a hundred square foot or less is in the buffer, that uh, scratch. Thank you. Mr. Rose, do you have anything to add? Uh, no, I just thank you to the staff for helping. Thank you to the staff for helping us get the drawings accurate, so you can see where the buffer is. There was a, quite a discussion on where to show the proper buffer. One, one other point I might make is uh, Mr. Uh, Haray here has said that he is willing to raise the bottom of the fence up to get above the hundred-year flood, but we do want to keep the fence as a physical barrier because people do walk along the creek, and we're coming up into the property from the creek. So we don't want, the, the fence doesn't have to be there all the way to the ground, uh, but we would like to keep it, uh, raising it at least a foot or so, to, so the water level is below the bottom of the fence, but keep a physical barrier there so people don't just walk right up into the property. 
Depending on your question, Mr. Chairman, that would conclude our presentation. Okay, thank you. Well, let's go ahead and do our uh, public portion of the this item on the agenda. Is there anyone here from the public to speak in favor of or in opposition to this request? All right, seeing none, then uh, let's do some panel discussion and we'll probably have some questions for you. So let's open it up to us. Go ahead. On the public discussion, I do want to enter in the record that the councilwoman for this area gave us a letter of support, which we'd like to enter into the record in the public uh, portion. Sure. <clears throat> Am I saying your name right, Mr. Hawray? Yes, sir. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Hawray, for uh, cleaning up the site. Thank uh, you. You've probably got quite a bit of water quality benefit just from doing that. So. Uh, so I, I, I guess my questions are going to be focused on how flooding might carry this material away and affect public infrastructure downstream and private property downstream. So can staff speak to how vulnerable um, uh, this material um, is to being displaced by flooding, being transported downstream? Uh, uh, and affecting public infrastructure and private property. And, and I'll, I'll preface that by saying that my perception of this is that uh, these fences made up of individual planking nailed um, in fairly small increments across beams and posts that are individual beams and posts. So when this material breaks up, it'll start off as probably panels and it'll probably break down into planks and posts. The, the building is made up of individual segments of metal uh, and fairly small metal poles. So that's gonna break up in a flood, assuming a flood of that magnitude could do that at this particular site. So, so my perception is, is that we're not talking about big propane tanks that would float downstream. Or we're not talking about big sections of material that that might lodge in a culvert and, and force more flood water off on somebody that didn't used to get flooded because the culvert's now clogged up with all this debris. But can you all give us some insight on that? Well, I will say that uh, typically in areas like this, we kind of don't, it seems very counterproductive or counterintuitive, but we usually don't like to see like loose gravel over here. So usually whenever we're confronted with a situation like this, we kind of prefer something that's more, more of a, a paved surface. So that way that, you know, this stuff doesn't wash into the creeks. Um, obviously, uh, I don't think the stormwater division is going to ever go into Mill Creek and, and dredge anything out of there. That would, um, we, it's just not typically done. Uh, as far as fencing, you know, we, we, we talk internally about fencing all the time about what does it do for actual floodwaters. Um, I, I think you're kind of right. I think some of these planks will loosen up and, 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 and venture off down Mill Creek somewhere. And I think it's gonna be up to the applicant to maintain uh, defense as it goes down. Um, what happens to the planks? That, that, that actually is a, a, a good question to, to be raising. So, so you all are actually more concerned about the gravel sounds like well the gravel is there um if, if they would have came in we would have probably <clears throat> excuse me had probably had told them hey you may want to consider something more um more hardened that wouldn't wash away or be a maintenance burden okay so so the normal process that, that I have participated in the past would be to try to have some kind of mitigation offset the encroachments and the hardening of the buffer. But this is a little more complicated. We got material that can be displaced. Um, okay, so that answers my question. Uh, so. Mr. Chairman, uh, I'd like to also address that question as an engineer as well, because it's a very good question. But uh, what I would point out that the areas that we have that are encroaching or encroaching into the edge of the buffers, this is quite a distance from the floodway, which is where the fast moving waters are during a flood. These waters are not gonna be fast moving waters, but the water can get up to these elevations. Uh, this is why I don't think we're gonna have an impact with anything being carried off. And by raising the fence that you see there to allow to, I mean, we're, we're at inches and feet, the bottom foot of that fence coming up in, in a section where it does encroach with the floodplain, 
will allow water to go under it without touching the bottom of what we intend to leave. And the gravel there is pretty heavy. Without a fast moving water, this is gonna be a, a, a you, you know how floodplains are, the water's calm at the edge, but you see water where you never normally see it. And it's, it's stunning, but it's not fast moving water. And I would anticipate no debris uh, leaving this site. Uh, but that's that's my opinion. Thank you. Um, I have a question or two. I'm a little confused as well. Um, <clears throat> this was a car lot before, and I guess um, I assumed that in the floodway and the floodway buffer they had all kinds of vehicles. I saw all that. I guess it was unregulated. I don't know that stormwater would be involved in that. I'm, I'm sort of curious how we even got to this point. So. The, was there a plan submitted to codes? Was there an application for a, a, a building permit? How did we actually wind up looking at this? To uh, me, I mean, it's that, and I need you to also help educate me a little bit about this as well. You've got all kinds of people that live along Mill Creek, along Seven Mile Creek. They all mow their yards. They're all in buffers. We don't regulate those, and we don't normally regulate those until you do a development plan or until you do addition to a building or substantial improvement to a property. So had he not put this storage building there and he put a fence up, would we even be seeing this? Yeah, I think there was um, kind of two sides to this. One, one was some of those structures were built without permits, so codes had been trying to get him to pull permits and also. Which structures? We need some detail. Um, the carport specifically, I believe. The carport, there are those two. Cause the, the carport that's in question. Yeah, I think there was one that was existing and one that was. No, but see this plan's got another one sitting over here in this corner. That's what I'm trying to figure out. What, there's two, on this plan there's two new carports. So I'm trying to figure out what exactly happened. Why are we here? That's, I mean, that's the question. Should, should probably been presented in the very beginning. I'm, I understand the concerns about flooding and damage and all that. I, I got it. I understand that. I just don't know what regulate, regulative authority we have. I'm not sure what we're doing here. Uh, if they had put a different type of fence in, one that was like a chain link fence, would, would we still be here? Uh, so well, I, well, I don't know. How, 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 why are we here? Yeah. Did he get cited? Yeah, he, he received a uh, notice of violation from um, MPDS. Is that originally. on here? I mean, I is, is that written anywhere that we understand that that's why we're here? I don't, I don't think so. Okay. Yeah, I don't think it was in the... Probably should write them that way. Yeah. So, so, so what happened is you got cited and, and then came in and started talking to Stormwater and then and then said, okay, why don't you submit for a variance? Is that why we're here? So before he came into possession of the property, the previous owner had went and got a self-building permit to make some minor repairs to the interior of the structure. The structure is what? The, the, the main structure, no, nothing in the floodway. The, okay, the, used, so the used car lot proper. There's a building yeah. here that's... That's right. Okay. That's right. He'd, he'd got a building permit, and when Mr. Muhammad bought the property, he just thought he'd keep that guy as the contractor and, you know, self-contract and do, keep doing the work. And then he got cited by codes. For not having a contract. Right, and he's got okay. temporary UNO. All, it's going to be a self. He's, he's doing it himself, so he didn't need a contractor. But he's got temporary UNOs ever since to keep going and the condition is you know before his final UNO is this approval is the way I understand it okay Do, yeah that's, I mean, that's correct thank you and so the, the current owner purchased the property while it was in mid fix up that's right and I just assumed you'd be able to continue the fix up that was already in, in play and right. part of that fix up was installing this fence spreading out that gravel picking up the trash and then it says there's two new carports. So then there were two new carports placed on this one site. The truck. Over here. The one that is attached to the building was already structured. I don't know who put it there. So when you purchased the, the property, 
the, the, the one that says new car, because there's two on this plan I'm looking at that say new car for. One's yeah. right up next to the building. Yes, sir, that was the attached. That one that was I'm, there already. That was already there. That's and okay. the other one, that well, the alignment one, it was in the property, but it was not exactly right there. So you and moved it over into a place that's now in the buffer, so now it's an issue. Yes, sir. Okay. And that's uh, where it is, uh, they, I asked it a couple times, not, you know, uh, to to find out what is that type of building. They just said carport. You can move it wherever you want. That's right. And, yeah. and I believe you've offered to move that out of the buff. I am, sir. sir. Okay. And then what's this wood planking? Did you put that down? That looks like new wood. Uh, it is, sir. Okay. Uh, it was uh, basically like a... Um, it was a dirt because we put tires on it, so it is. So um, you've got product you're going to put there. So instead of laying it in the dirt, you put that board down to keep yes, it sir. dry. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Tire storage. That's right. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, and that's in the second buffer. Am I? Is, is that correct? Right? Okay. All right. So what are the blood beforehand? That was a hard dirt surface. Yes, sir. And then you've covered a hard dirt surface with that plywood. Yes, sir. All right, I at least wanted to understand. What kind of flood depths are there on this property? Say it again, sir. The, the depth, the 100-year flood depth. Um, 12 to 18 inches. I mean, not, not much. It's encroaching into there, but it's very... Okay, so the, the point that the fence is the closest to the creek, what would be the flood depth at that point? Uh, it's only 12 to 18 inches. And that's why we said we could cut the fence and let water come under mm -hmm. it and not impede the flow. But that still would prevent people from coming in okay. by leaving the physical barrier. So I'd like to, I'd like to make a motion. Uh, unless, yeah. Yeah. I'd like to make a motion to allow the variance to, um, uh, including he's offered to move that one carport out. I think that's a good idea, but otherwise, um, uh, uh, accept the variance request. And, and, and I don't think, um, that a request to take the bottom of the fence is a good idea for, for, couple of reasons. One, it's not actually in the floodway. So any water that goes up in there is going to be backwater and it's going to slowly, and it's going to go up underneath. It's going to go, it's going to get into that area. So it's not taking up uh, flood capacity because it's going to go through those panels. And, and, and quite frankly, to the extent the water is fast enough, those panels are going to keep that rock inside, <laughs> inside the fence and, yeah, and the tires. So it seems to me that keeping the fence the way it is is actually the better idea. So my motion is to uh, uh, grant the variance, uh, which in Includes his offer to move the carport, uh, and now that's the motion on the floor. If we can get second. All right, great. We've got a second. So let's do some discussion on the motion. Any discussion on the motion? Yeah, I, I, we're just trying to be thorough. We're trying to make sure that downstream property owners and public infrastructure are protected. Um, th these are fairly minor intrusions. It's not what we would desire. We'd rather you, you had gone through due process, and we would have worked out a much better situation for you. Um, we only regulate issues around 100-year floods. There are much bigger floods and 100-year flood events that we don't have the authority to regulate that you may be personally, civilly liable for in regard to downstream damages when your material is displaced by a bigger flood. When the floodway gets bigger during bigger flood events, uh, floodways don't stay the same in every storm. They're smaller and smaller storms. They get bigger and bigger storms. So, you know, you might want to be cognizant of what you're, of, of what you're liable for in a bigger flood. Okay, so and that, that's just friendly feedback. Uh, and I'm happy to support the motion. I'm going to add to this also. I went to school in Antioch. I've lived here most of my life. And this site was bad before I remember it. So I, th I think you've done some good stuff here. Thank you, sir. All right, one point, any other discussion on the motion? All right, motion to approve the variance. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Seeing none, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You guys have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let's move to uh, the next agenda item, uh, which is 9300 Barco Drive. Morning, gentlemen. Were you all here when the opening statement was first read? Yes. yes. Wonderful. And we don't have to do that again. Then let's go straight into a um, explanation of the request by staff. Sure thing. So this is case number two. Before I get to case number two, we had a uh, request from Rich, uh, Mill Creek Watershed Alliance. They asked us to say which ones of these variances were in the Mill Creek Watershed Alliance, uh, Mill Creek Watershed. 
we responded every case that we have today is in the Mill Creek watershed. <laughs> so I just wanted to let you guys know that in the package should be some, uh, some responses from, from the Mill Creek Watershed Alliance. Okay, case number two is 2019-00006, Brinkley Property, phase one, uh, located at parcel number 187, 180, oh, excuse me, 18070A902-00CO and 18070A903-00, uh, sorry, 00CO. The inspector is Sean Herman, and this is Council District 31, Councilman Bedney. Uh, case was previously requested for deferral on June 6, 2019, before being presented uh, to the Stormwater Management Committee, and it was to allow a 36-inch pipe uh, to remain in place in lieu of a, a three-sided box culvert. So the request is the same, to allow the 36-inch pipe to remain. Uh, the appellant is Green Trails, uh, being represented by Kevin Estes with Land Solution. It's not Kevin Estates, so Kevin Estes. Stormwater staff comments. If the variance is approved, please switch the white fringe trees on the wetland enhancement plan to another species, as it is susceptible to the emerald ash borer infestation. Codes provided no comments. Uh, planning has approved the final SP as is consistent with the requested variance. Uh, and the greenways uh, will defer to the stormwater management committee. Thank you. I'll just talk loud into the mic. Um, um, we don't have, I don't have a great story to tell you on this. Uh, we had hired an environmental consultant, Tony Grow, to do the permitting for us when we bought this um, subdivision. We bought this from a gentleman, Mr. David Chase, who has passed since. Um, Our consultant showed this as wet weather conveyance. The state came back and said it was waters of the state. We went for a permit. Um, my engineer, Ryan, did the correct thing and showed a three-sided box. We have a drainage area of about four acres here draining to this site. And so I talked to the state and not Metro and got the permit amended to put a enclosed pipe there and put an enclosed pipe there. I um, uh, did not talk to Ryan about that, and I would have known that no matter where there's waters of the state, you have to have a three-sided box. Um, the sizing that was needed for this was about a 15-inch pipe, but this has about 30-some-odd feet of fill over it, so we didn't want to have to deal with maintenance issues, so we created the pipe big enough not to have it clogged. I have, this has been in place for a while. It's the only access in and out of this subdivision at the moment and for the next couple of years. I brought Brandon Ye to the state out. I believe he has sent an email. He believes this is well vegetated, well maintained. and believes his recommendation is that it's better for this tributary ditch to remain in place, um, we have offered to go up to the existing pond, and the problem is the pond leaks. This is an old farm pond. It leaks, and so there's always a trickle here. This isn't a spring or anything else that we can tell. We've tried to figure out what this is. It's basically this pond's been there for 40 some odd years and leaks. Um, the pond's not very well oxygenated, so it creates this red um, algae inside of it. So we've, talking to um, our environmental engineers, they think planting some vegetation, getting some good roots, some aeration into that pond would help that. So that is what we're requesting. Um, our, our hardship here is really this is, we have 50, homes here. There's no way in and out other than this Barco Road. We have 30 feet of fill on top of this pipe and we would destroy 
hundreds of feet of this tributary to try to put a new culvert there and reroute this. Um, and we'd have to, I don't even know how we would do it. We'd have to build a new road, <laughs> put a pipe there, come back, try to put a three culvert pipe here, try to build a new a road back, and then we can't, we can't cut off people from having access inside and outside of this subdivision. All these houses are built. We're required to put the paving here. Um, so we have to come and get a decision from y'all. So we would ask that y'all let us leave this pipe in place, mitigate it with some plantings, and um, that's our request. Thank you. Anyone from here from the public speak in favor of uh, or in opposition to this request? Seeing none, let's turn the discussion over to the panel. Committee. All right, I'll start. I'll make sure I understand the story. <laughs> so uh, this was originally a development that was approved with a three-sided box uh, underneath this road. Uh, and it needed to be a three-sided box because this is waters of the state. Yes, sir. And did, did that plan have to come before us for any reason, or was it? We approved a, uh, I mean, it was approved as a large subdivision, and okay. it was approved with a three-sided box. And there was nothing, it, no, there were no issues that had to come before us, so it's not like we've no, seen sir. it. So it was all okay. perpendicular crossings. And so during the construction process, a 36-inch round pipe was installed as opposed to a three-sided box. Yes, sir. Um, and that change didn't go through the proper request channels. Exactly. Not because someone knew they were not doing the right thing, but someone just thought that they could do that. I, I do not know. I think yeah. it came in as the as-built, and I, I think the as-built showed. During the as-built process, we were checking to make sure they did everything right, and they said, hey, wait a minute, you've got a 36-inch pipe. Right. It needs to have a natural bottom. Yes. Okay. And now the question is whether or not we let it stay in place or we make them do something different. Exactly. Normally, we would not actually bring a case like this to you as we would say, it's, there's not a hardship and you just need to go and replace it. I think this case, they actually made, um, they made some pretty compelling uh, arguments why this would be a hardship to go before you guys, so we thought we'd bring it to you guys. Yeah, so not, even a, not, not only a hardship, but also there's an environmental <laughs> uh, evaluation to see whether or not it's actually better to make them do what was originally doing. Well, I think that the it was twofold for us. I think it was a uh, it was a safety issue. Is that this was the only entrance in and out, and then the other idea was uh, potentially they could have more disturbance yeah. uh, to the buffer to to fix than leave. So, not not saying we support, not saying we don't support. We're just saying that we felt that there was a decent argument for our hardship. Certainly something to be weighed. Yes, sir. Thank you. When the three question. When the three box culvert was um, placed in there, did we look at the, the issue as far as habitat was concerned? Was that thought about before they put in the, the 36 inch pipe or is it afterwards? We, then we said, oh, okay, you know what? They, they went about it the right way. Am, am, am I explaining myself correctly? Well, I'll, I'll try to rephrase uh, what was said earlier. So we approved it as a three sided box because it was listed as a strain. So streams require an open bottom versus a enclosed structure. Right. Um, I, I think the applicants filled in from the point of plan approval to where we are today, as far as how they got to a, uh, <laughs> a closed bottom. Um, I'm not aware of anything other than, you know, from the approved plans to, uh, to where we are today. I can answer that, I believe. Part of our permit from the state, because this is waters that drain to Mill Creek, even though Mill Creek's a couple miles away, is that we have environmental sweeps and assessments before any work's done to this area. And all those environmental sweeps and assessments were done. This was found not to have any habitat that went to Mill Creek whatsoever. And um, it did have environmental science just out there as the pipe was being installed as a requirement of the permit and the state was also present and the state walked this before and after but um, Brandon Yates and once again ignorance is not an excuse so I'm not pleading that the state okayed us to put in this pipe we we thought the state ruled 
we now know the state doesn't rule. Metro overrules the state in this area. But environmentally, all things were followed on the permit. Well, I, I don't want to say we overrule because that's not that's not really the case. It's just that um, when you have to meet TDEX uh, policies, you still have to meet Metro Waters policies just as well if you have to meet public works or codes or whoever it may be. It's I just, apologize. Yeah. I meant Metro's rules are more stringent on this than the states. Well, so if he had gone to the state and the state had okayed this, I assume he could have resubmitted it back to Metro and you could have evaluated it based upon that or no? We, we would we would not. We would say that if you wanted to put a, whether you have a state permit or not, we mm -hmm. would say you have to go for a variance to put it in. But a, then he would be back to us at that point. Right. Okay. So that was the process that was. If everything happened as mm, planned, okay. then you would have you would have heard this case okay. prior to the installation of the okay. pipe. All right. And so we would have had any of that knowledge about, you know, whatever discussions they'd had with the state. So. So have, have um, it seems to me the the main issue here is that from well, the two issues, it's less than ideal. Um, there's a reason why Metro uh, government in Nashville wants to protect habitat with this type of situation, not just because we want to be more stringent, it's because we're trying to create a higher quality community, which raises property values, raises the reason why people want to come live here and gives us the quality of life we have. But secondly, um, is there any kind of public safety concern from this pipe not being an adequate conveyance of water, creating some type of instability to the structure? If, is, is there any chance that this pipe will create a long-term hazard that should have been fixed while we're reviewing it now? I do not believe so. Okay, then. <laughs> I move, I, I'm ready to make a motion. That's a good question, but what I heard is that it was it was needed to be sized for 15 and ended up being a 36, which, yeah. That's even better. Yeah. So I'll, I'll move we accept it as submitted and uh, we'll wait for the opinions of my fellow committee members. I'll uh, second that motion. So there's a motion now on the floor uh, to approve the variance request uh, based on um, the uh, hardships and the circumstances discussed uh, during this meeting. Is there any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Any opposed? None. Thank you, gentlemen. You have a good day. All right. Next matter on the list. Not the right piece of paper. Uh, 5040 Linbar Drive. Is the applicant here? Oh, there we go. All right. This is the deferred matter. Um, I believe you guys were here when the opening statement was read. Correct. Wonderful. So we won't do that again. Uh, and we'll move right into a... Um, all of us were here last month, right? He was not? Okay. So let's let's go ahead and do a staff summary then. I think the rest of the ones that were here probably remember this. Uh, but uh, staff summary would be great. This is case 2019-00008, 5040 and 5042 Linbar Drive. It's on tax map 148, parcels 183 and 285. It's in Council District 30. Uh, the inspector for the site is Sean Herman. The applicant is here to request the disturbance of the 75-foot floodway buffer that's Zone 1 and Zone 2 of Sagram Branch to renovate two existing buildings and construct new townhome apartments to allow continuous mowing and maintenance of portions of the buffer area to construct and uh, the construction and encroachment of minimally, of minimally disruptive hardscape to reroute sidewalk to a location further from the floodway. They're requesting waiver of buffer signage. They're also requesting to not flood proof or raise the existing structure to one foot above the base flood elevation of 510 based on the North American vertical datum of, of 88 for commercial structures or four feet above the BFE for residential structures. The appellant is Robert Matthews of LB Associates LLC. The representative is Trip Smith of s &H Engineering. As far as comments go, stormwater staff has none provided. Codes has none provided. Planning defers to, to stormwater. 
and Greenways defers to the decision of the of Stormwater Management Committee. Within the emails received from the Mill Creek Watershed, uh, Watershed Association, you will find that they have provided comments. Thank you. With that, we'll turn it over to the applicant. Good morning. I want to thank you for your time. Uh, we'd also like to thank staff for uh, working with us on this project through uh, a deferral and uh, trying to find the best solution for the property. Um, if I could ask Eli, the most revised plan that I sent this week, was is that in their packet or have they seen that plan? Yes, it was forwarded on to Penny who distributed it. Okay. I just wanted to make sure there was a, a very minor revision that included an external stairway um, that was uh, in that buffer at the 5042 building and just wanted to make sure that you guys were aware of that um, before we moved forward. Um, in the interest of the committee's time, uh, it's my understanding, I, I was not here uh, at, the, at the July meeting, but it's my understanding from uh, reviewing the video of the meeting that the general consensus of the committee um, was, I don't want to speak for the committee, but the concern was really the finished floor elevation of the 5042 structure. Um, hey, Tripp, let me stop you just, mm -hmm. for, just to help. One of the committee members was not here. Okay. So, so it probably you probably ought to give at least just a quick rundown of here's okay. what's existing, here's what we're proposing, so that he understands. So, um, as you can see from the from the image, uh, both existing structures uh, at 5040 and 5042 Limbar currently reside within the Zone One and Zone Two buffer. Um, variances one through four are associated um, with existing parking areas and existing building encroachments into those buffers. Um, we are proposing to remove approximately 10,000 square feet um, of existing impervious area within those buffers. So I believe it's a little over 9,000 square feet in zone one and uh, about 300 square feet in zone two. Uh, we are also proposing uh, 2,700 square feet of bioretention water quality treatment between the two sites. Um, all of those retention areas lie outside of both the zone one and zone two buffer. Um, and then we are also proposing to preserve or restore um, approximately 11,000 square feet um, of true buffer area in those zone one areas that we are that we feel like we can, where we don't require a, a mow or maintain policy in, in areas around the building. Um, so that's kind of our proposal and mitigation plan associated with variances one through four that include uh, no mow maintain, the buffer disturbance, waiver of signage, and uh, minimally disruptive hardscape uh, adjacent to the floodway. Um, so, so catching up uh, it, and from following up from the July meeting, the, the biggest concern was the, the base flood elevation. Uh, as, uh, as it pertains to the finished floor elevation of the 5042 structure, which uh, the base flood elevation at that location on the property is 509.9 uh, per the flood elevation certificates, I believe, that were provided. Um, and then the existing finished floor elevation is 5102, um, which is approximately four inches above the uh, base flood elevation. So um, there were some questions asked during the July meeting uh, requesting more design information uh, associated with the program and then also uh, what flood proofing um, measures we might be able to take at that structure to, uh, to offset, I guess, the fact that we, we weren't intending to raise the floor um, of the existing building and the fact that the existing building was not uh, a foot above the, the base flood elevation. Um, so to, to bring everybody up to speed, the, the concept here is a, an affordable workforce housing concept, um, repurposing existing commercial office buildings for residential per the adaptive residential special condition. Um, there, were th there are 13 units on the bottom floor of 5042 building. These units would be a mix of one bedroom and studio apartments. Um, the, uh, the stormwater committee also asked in the July meeting for us to consider other land uses for the building. Uh, the existing building at 5042, I believe, has been vacant for the last 10 years um, as, as an office building. 
Um, so I think that is, uh, speaks to or, or provides some evidence about uh, intended land use for the property. Um, it's, you know, it was also thought, could we do something like retail or something on the bottom floor while we did residential on the top floor? Um, it's my understanding, and, and maybe Alan can speak to this if, uh, when, later when you guys have questions as far as uh, the market analysis, um, but that retail is not feasible here given its location um, off of a main, you know, off of a main street, and it, it, you really would have, uh, it'd be very difficult to acquire a tenant um, for that with uh, multifamily residential living above it. Um, but I'll let him, I'll allow him to elaborate on that if you guys would like. I think it's also important to note that uh, during the May 2010 flood, this property was listed. I'm not sure what level, maybe, you got, but it was the minimum zero to 25% damage class, which it's my understanding, it's, you're talking again about there was evidence of flooding outside the banks on the property, whether that be a watermark or debris or that sort of thing. There was no actual damage to the property itself. Um, there were no insurance claims um, that were filed for, for either of the properties. Um, I think it's also important uh, in our investigation and conversations with staff, um, there exists a AMEX spreadsheet where they talk about their damage assessment and property assessment for, uh, for what happened during the flood. Um, these addresses did not even appear on their spreadsheet for damage at the property during the, the 2010 flood. Um, I think it was also discussed at the July meeting as far as metro requirements versus FEMA requirements. Um, please correct me if I'm wrong, but it's my understanding the building as it is currently um, complies with FEMA guidelines to just be above the base flood elevation. Um, and so what we are proposing to do um, is to drop flood proof the 5042 structure up to one foot above the base flood elevation um, in accordance with um, FEMA dry flood proofing guidelines, documents. Um, that would include a grout fill of exterior CMU walls um, and cavity from existing wall footers to 12 inches above the base flood elevation. Uh, painting of the exterior masonry walls with uh, like a Tenemic EnviroCrete series waterproofing or, or equivalent. Um, if you can see, I can, let me provide you some pictures too before I get into this. I just have two packets, I apologize if you guys can share. So I, I don't believe these pictures were initially included in the packet, um, and so I wanted, uh, as we're talking about dry flood proofing measures and kind of what currently exists at the building, I think these pictures will be helpful at the 5042 structure. Um, so as you can see from these pictures, the window seals currently uh, extend pretty close to exterior grade. We don't have an actual elevation on the bottom of those window seals, but our proposal would be to remove those windows as required to um, elevate those window openings and seal any openings to one foot above base flood elevation. Um, as you can see from those pictures, there's currently already um, a stoop. I also have the flood elevation certificates if you'd like to look at them, such that the exterior grade and the entry into the existing building at 5042 is already a foot above base flood elevation. And then you actually step down after entering the building to the finished floor elevation. Um, and so some of that dry flood proofing measures, if you will, for exterior improvements is, is already in place. Uh, there may be an opportunity to, to increase those, but, but that elevation is already a foot above the base flood elevation. Um, the current proposal for the concept, um, which I have, if you guys would like to look at the floor, floor plan for the 5042 building. Um, I don't know that I included elevations. I was trying to not kill too many trees. Um, um, but on, on the uh, interstate facing elevation of the 5042 structure, uh, there's some Juliet balconies that would be proposed um, at, the, at the floor level units. Uh, we, would, we would also, as part of our dry flood proofing measures, 
um, proposed to, to do flood shielding at those balconies up to one foot above the base flood elevation. Um, and then uh, the last two measures that we would propose to take would be uh, install of backwater flow valves on any of the sanitary sewer service laterals serving the building, as well as watertight seal of any conduit penetrations that would be below that one foot above base flood elevation for the, for the structure. Um, the only other thing I wanted to bring up, and I went back and reviewed this case because it looks like you guys had um, reviewed and approved a decision uh, at the April meeting of this year for a Scott's Hollow case uh, at 4800 Lebanon Pike, which has some similarities to our property. They're not identical um, by any means. And it, it appeared, I, I kind of, I tried to follow it as best I can, I could, um, but it appeared as if they removed their they, they decided to flood proof a foot above or raise a portion of the building a foot above base flood elevation to, to basically remove that variance request. Um, and so uh, whereas we may still need to allow this variance request to stand depending on how the committee sees these as commercial versus residential structures, um, I did want to note that we are taking that effort to flood proof one foot above the base flood elevation as they did and, and what we have the ability to really to do on this property. Um, with that, if you guys have anything else, I think, I think we're, we're good and we're happy to answer any questions that we can. Thank you. Uh, let's see if there's anyone here from the public speak either in favor of or in opposition to this request. Seeing none, uh, committee discussion. Questions? Just, oh, just real quick, I think this was noted at the July meeting, but we have spoken with Councilman Potts and he is in support of, of this concept and development at this property, is Thank in favor you. of it, so. All right, let's turn it over to uh, the committee questions. And I, I first, what I recall is that these are gonna be apartments? Apartments, that's apartments. correct. Okay. Okay, I'll start since I know the least about it, but um, I appreciate uh, everything you describe. So everything you describe in your presentation is part of your variance proposal. All those elements, all those flood proofings, all those details are, are part of your formal submission for the variance, okay. Um, yeah, um, but I, I guess if, if staff could, could give us a little bit of feedback on, uh, you know, we, we've got this new recent phenomenon of storm events in Nashville becoming more concentrated and, and, and occurring with greater intensity and, and maybe a little more duration, where, where large rain events, six, seven, eight, nine inch rainfalls are kind of dropping out in a little more localized locations. Uh, you know, I think we had a big rainfall event in Whites Creek about a year ago that you know, dropped an unusual amount of water in one place. So we've got a little bit of weather weirding going on in the, in the past couple of years, or, well, since 2010 particularly. And uh, so that kind of changes some of the statistical reliability that we've kind of depended upon in the past. Uh, so uh, do you all have any kind of expectations that you know, uh, we're setting up a situation for people who are, uh, as I understand, this is going to be a, a targeted for lower income type category residents. I, I'm a little concerned about not understanding uh, this type of proposal when people who are a little more vulnerable, who have a little less capacity to recover the cost of all of their living room furniture, which is what all these, these first floor elevation uh, suites look like. Uh, and all their personal belongings in that one flood that didn't wasn't statistically predictable because we're in a period of kind of weather weirding, um, and 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 putting them in that situation when we didn't have to because we wouldn't be here if this weren't a variance. So we don't have to do it, but um, everything I've heard sounds very reasonable. Uh, our past experience with this site tells us it's a reasonable thing to consider trying to bring this back to a, a viable property. Commercial use of the property obviously hasn't been working. You're working with existing buildings. You're willing to mitigate the buffer. You're willing to flood proof everything. I just, just wanna make sure we're making the right call for people who can't control their circumstances because we put them there or because we made it possible for them to be there. <laughs> uh, Commissioner, uh, you, you said a lot. Um, 
<laughs> I, I do teach classes, so I apologize for, uh, for the, the, the academic lecture as well, so. <laughs> can you repeat only the question that you had? <laughs> so I sure can, I sure can. Um, so do you all perceive that there is a flood event on this site that we should be concerned about because of recent weather weirding? There are always going to be events that are beyond our ability to predict. At present, we only have the statistics that have already occurred. We can't base our judgment based on the unknown. We have to go based on the most, uh, the, what we've observed and what we can reasonably predict based on that. Um, okay. okay. Well, um, I appreciate that, and um, and 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 that, I think that's the the main issue we're dealing with here is should we uh, grant the opportunity for this type of risk to to take place? That's a very good question. So uh, I'll just go ahead and just reiterate what the applicant said in a different way. It rains the hundred year. Nobody has any problems. If it rains the hundred year plus one, and they flood proof the plus one then you would assume that if they did it to the right regulation, no one has problems. If it does do one of those unpredicted events and it rains 100 year plus four, then, then there's gonna be some issues. So it's 100, 100 plus one, 100 plus four feet is what it's really boiling down to. That's what it boils down to for me. So in, 2000, in 2010, the flood event on the Cumberland River, was it a 500-year event? Is that what we classify this as? I think it'll depend on who you talk to. Okay. Someone will say back-to-back -back 500 years. Somebody uh -huh. else will say maybe it's close to 1,000. Okay. Uh, <coughs> if, if you're up near Pages Branch, you, you probably say, uh, I probably didn't get that much. So, uh, so on Mill Creek during 2010, did we classify the level of that event? For that, for that watershed? In 2010, Mill Creek got hit pretty hard. But was it a 100-year event or was it 100 plus? I think it's over 100 year. Yeah, okay. And so in 2010, this property showed moderate damage, is that what you said? It, it's our, it's, yeah. The buildings had no damage. So did water get into the buildings at all? Didn't okay. I have the, um, the blue line up there is the 2010 flood inundation line and um, and it's kind of hard to see, but it shows this building is kind of an island. Um, the, the ingress and egress was, was flooded, but the building itself was not. And then this building was, was not flooded either. Th th these blue lines are the flood inundation. I mean, one of the, I think a key point that was brought up that, that it's a recessed floor. So the, the well, I think it's, the, the floor is at the elevation, it's, it's four inches above, is that what you said? No, but, but the entrance to the building is at a higher elevation, right. therefore it that, that's why the, That's why they've got this, yeah. the water's not even getting up yeah, to get yeah, in. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so um, I, I just, so in 2010, you're saying it didn't, didn't get into the building. Right. So, um, it's interesting. So there was no, um, is there any chance that groundwater can come up from below? Pesiotic pressure, you know, that type of stuff? Slab on grade. Slab on grade, okay. That helps to know. Um, it, it, it is important to say, and I, 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 you know, I'm, I'm leaning towards supporting this because of all of the uh, circumstances surrounding it. My hesitation is, is that I know that there are storm events like what we experienced in 2010, that it had, if it had shifted a mile or two this way or a mile or two that way or 10 miles that way, the inundation patterns might have been very different on this site. And that, that kind of goes to the point of staff earlier that we can't predict the worst case scenario because it, it could happen. Uh, uh, there could be a storm event that would flood the first floor elevation of this building. I mean, it, it, it could happen. But um, we, we, help me understand this. Is, is this a willing seller, willing buyer 
property uh, or is this a placement property for for people of low income I'm, i miss the first part of the it is it, it, is this going to be managed as a as a residential development where a willing buyer or a willing renter voluntary approaches a willing uh, rent? It, the, the intent is targeted at workforce but there's not there's there's no incentives associated with okay. with I mean, it's it's market rate, but at a lower price point. Okay, so it's, it's basically a, a, a willing buyer, willing seller That's arrangement. Right. Okay, so That's people, right. if people understand that there's a risk, if they choose to accept that risk, then uh, it, it's not like they've been encouraged to, to do it, except for the fact that we're making it a little bit easier to use it for residential purposes. Okay, all right, all right. I know everything I need to know, so. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and make a motion to approve as requested. Um, I, d I just have one thing I I'd like to read, if that's okay. Uh, this is from FEMA's document called Selecting Appropriate Mitigation Measures for Flood-Prone Structures. And in that document, on the section of dry flood proofing, it says that dry flood proofing may not be used to bring a substantially damaged or substantially improved residential structure into compliance with the community's floodplain management ordinance or law. Would you mind repeating that for me, please? Dry flood proofing may not be used to bring a substantially damaged or substantially improved residential structure into compliance with the community's floodplain management ordinance or law. So, um, so we, we've had a discussion in the past about how these types of decisions affect our flood insurance rates. Does that change? your all's perception of, of what this means. So this was kind of, uh, you, you, didn't, you didn't get it, but um, this was kind of discussed previously at the last meeting. Um, our elevation requirements that we have that are in, in excess of what uh, FEMA requires do provide us a benefit. Um, so we do get benefits and at any given time FEMA could drive by and say, hey, I want building permits, elevation certificates on whatever X, Y, or Z building. I think what you guys got to figure out is FEMA doesn't allow it. Our manual doesn't allow it as far as if you want to do it. If, if somebody came to Logan and said, I want to flood proof this residential structure in lieu of elevating, we would tell them, no, you can't do that. You must build to the right elevation. Uh, if somebody says, I want to build this resident uh, commercial property and I want to build it three feet below the hundred year but I want to flood proof it four feet higher and meet that requirement we could do it at staff level w w doesn't require to come to the committee uh, what I don't know is whether you guys could say it meets FEMA's requirements you guys are satisfied and this is something that you guys are going to say above and beyond that would satisfy your concerns um, if, if that's the route you go, it may make you guys happy, and it may make FEMA happy in respect to does it meet FEMA's, FEMA's requirements, but I'm not sure what their response would be as far as, hey, does it meet Metro's requirements? Do you read this thing? Dry flood proofing may not be used to bring a substantially damaged or substantially improved residential structure into compliance with the community's floodplain management ordinance or law. So I guess it's my understanding that they could voluntarily flood proof to one foot above, but it wouldn't be seen as any insurance benefit. It would just, they would still rate the insurance like it was four inches above. Uh, the, the the finished floor though is above it, the, it? the finished floor is currently above the base flood elevation yeah so um, and this isn't a situation where we're in violation of FEMA's regs and and then to that to, to Logan's statement um, we're, we're not really I guess asking for it to be in compliance of the local regulatory we're, we're asking for a variance um, but with the understanding that we are approving it to above FEMA standards. Um, I, I don't know that's important. Uh, there's also in the, in the 
dry flood proofing FEMA guidance document, there is a reference to um, ASCE structure classes, uh, categories one through four. Um, this this structure would classify as a, from, from my understanding, would, would classify as a structure two category, which again would fall to that recommendation of um, dry flood proofing one foot above base flood elevation, regardless of whether it's residential or, or commercial. And that's just associated with uh, occupancy of the, of the structure, uh, health safety, where like a, 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 an ASE category four structure would just be essential facilities like a hospital or something like that, where they would, where they would want you to go two foot above base flood elevation. I have a legal question. It's always confused me. You attorneys are something else. <laughs> so when, many times when you write something, you say shall not, could not, would not, will not, cannot. I mean, it's confusing to me. So what is, is it may not? Is, that was the word that was used. What does may not mean? <laughs> shall not, could not, would not, could not. So if, if I'm understanding correctly, mm -hmm. I do agree with the applicant's characterization of what they're asking for. That, that, that um, this is not being brought into compliance with the Metro Stormwater regs. They're asking for a variance instead. Yeah, and, and uh, still, I mean, I but, but, but based upon <laughs> the sentence that he read from, from FEMA, it says you may not, right? What if it said you shall not or you should not? I mean, what is the proper legal word that you're supposed to use when you can't do something? Yeah, so, so I mean, that's why someone comes and asks for a variance from this committee. It's because they cannot meet the regulations. If they could meet the regulations, then they would not need a variance. Most likely it's very poor drafting. <laughs> well, it cer always certainly case. creates billable time. So, so, <laughs> so the the uh, the uh, um, that my and that was going to be my observation, even though I'm not an attorney. But that you know he's asking for a variance. They're asking for a variance because it's not in compliance. And 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 what I was trying to get at earlier is that. If we're making it easier for a condition that's not normally allowed to occur, it has implications for the benefits that we've gained by being a little more conservative on this in the past, in, in, the, in the earliest form of the definition of conservative. So, uh, uh, you know, we're being careful, we're being prudent, we're being cautious not to allow this to occur without a variance. So. Um, you know, I, I, I've got two real concerns about this that's affecting my decision. One is I'm really not comfortable with putting people with less means in this type of situation, even though it's a willing seller, willing buyer environment, uh, because we're making it easier for that transaction to take place. Secondly, um, I, I do think given the 2010 flood and given the the um, the um, trend towards less predictable weather events that there are risks here that are new and and I, I do think we need to be a little more prudent a little more conservative about that uh, than in the past and, and most of our majority votes have tracked along that that path and um, and I, I uh, a commercial use of the property uh, would be an easy thing to do. It, it would meet current regulations. It could be handled at the staff level. Um, but just because someone chose an unprofitable use of this property in the past, it doesn't mean that we're obligated to make it profitable using another land use like residential development. That was somebody's prior decision and prior choice to tear that site up and put things there that weren't economically viable. And uh, um, sometimes that's how signals are sent to society and how investment opportunities are realigned and readjusted based upon that that bad experience and so I, you know i can't get comfortable with this is what i'm saying so i'll have to vote no i'd like to make a motion to approve as requested um based on uh, the last presentation and today's presentation i don't think there are any concerns with the mitigation and the environmental aspects of that request um, there's certainly a hardship to the property given the development's already in the buffer. 
I think the only the only issue um, at the last hearing, and I, and I think today, is um, the fact that it's residential uh, on this one lot. I think there's a difference between Metro believes and FEMA and FEMA believes there's a difference between commercial property and residential property. Uh, the difference is life safety. Uh, it's not it's not property destruction. Um, because property destruction applies both to commercial and residential. It's residential uh, is different because of life safety issues. Um, experience has shown us that even in the worst floods of Nashville, although at any point in time any flood can be coarse, uh, water does not get into this building. So I think experience shows us that uh, there's certainly not a life safety issue with this building. There may be a property destruction issue and uh, given uh, FEMA is the way it views, and Metro views, views uh, life safety versus commercial property issues differently. Uh, I do too. Um, and so I don't think this is gonna cause, even though it's a lower income, uh, lower income uh, user, um, I don't think the property issue is near as important as life safety. I've seen the life safety issue with this use. And so uh, my motion is to grant it as requested. I'll second it. I'll second the motion, but I'll add just my recent rationale behind it. Um, they've done exactly what we asked them to do based upon the last meeting that we had. Uh, it doesn't appear that this building flooded during the 2010 event, which was 100 plus, and we're flood proofing an additional foot. And so, um, and it isn't, it is used residentially, but it's, it's rental property. And I'm not sure how FEMA looks at the difference between rental property and ownership property, but I, th I think there's a difference. And so I think I'm comfortable, I am comfortable with this motion, so I do second it. So we've got a motion that's on the floor. Uh, we'll open that motion up for discussion among the committee. Call for the vote. Anyone else? I just have one question. Is this picture is this consistent around the whole, all sides of the building? It steps up, there's no doors at grade on any side. There are two entries into the building, um, one facing Sorghum Branch. It has a, um, an equivalent stoop that's elevated where that entry is elevated like you see on the handicap ramp and stair and access. Um, it, that barrier doesn't extend across the face of the building because there's not a ramp on that side, but there is an elevated stoop that is, the, the entries are on the same level, if I'm, That's right. if I understand that yep. correct. Um, so, so both of those are, both of those entry doors are a foot above base flood elevation. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank right. you. You look like you wanted to push your button. I'm waiting on you. You want to push your button? <laughs> that habits die hard. I'm not going to push the button. All right. Uh, seeing no more discussions, call over a vote. All in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 All opposed? Aye. The motion passes. The variance is granted. Thanks, guys. Appreciate your effort. Thank you all for your time. Thank, Thank you. All right, next matter uh, to be heard is wash and roll. 6804 Nolensville Pike is the applicant here. Wonderful. Were both of you gentlemen here earlier when the opening statement was read? Yes, sir. Wonderful. We don't have to do that again. Uh, and then, so first step will be uh, staff explanation of the request. Case number four is 2019-00009, wash and roll, located at 6804 Nolensville Pike. The inspector is Sean Herman, parcel number is 181-00005100. Um, uh, Council District 31, Councilman Bedney. Uh, please note this is a preliminary variance. The applicant's request is for the following. 1720 square feet of pervious concrete pavers in the zone one buffer. Uh, 3850 square feet of pervious concrete pavers in the zone two buffer. Continuous maintenance and mowing of the buffer. Turn the page. The appellant is H&J Realty, being represented by R. Wayne McCoy of Miller McCoy. Uh, no stormwater staff comments, no codes comments. 
Planning Site is Zoned uh, Commercial Limited to refer to stormwater. Uh, greenways also defers to stormwater. Thank you. One quick question. W what is a preliminary? What does that mean? Uh, a preliminary variance, <coughs> excuse me, is a variance that will probably have sli slightly less detail than a final var variance, and that one that the applicant will try to get a better feed of what the committee's feeling, uh, potentially to purchase property or not. I think that's the case in here. Um, what the implication is, if uh, they get feedback from you and they feel that they could probably uh, purchase the property for the intended use, they will come back at a later time for a final final variance. So the, the, the preliminary, if we grant it, it's nothing that can be relied upon. Regardless, they're going to have to come back in and get a, a formal variance for whatever the development would be. They will absolutely have to come back for a final variance. Interesting. Okay. I would love at a later time, I, I hate to say it, I'd love to be able to have a consent where we could do it at staff level if they meet everything on the preliminary, but that's just a, uh, uh, that's just a future dream. Okay. Um, then we'll turn uh, the presentation time over to the, the applicant. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, committee members. Um, I'd just like to start by saying thank you to staff for helping us uh, kind of wade through um, some of the challenges here and, and actually at the recommendation of staff to, co to go with the preliminary route, um, large in part, uh, um, due to kind of what he mentioned earlier about um, getting our getting our site plan exact and and kind of getting your feel and you know just to show that we're willing to work work with everybody so long as we have uh, um, you know the right and and uh, accurate plans. Uh, the site here is um, the the variance that we're requesting uh, preliminary variance that we're requesting is largely based in part by the hardship. Um, um, Twofold. One in that uh, a 50-foot uh, buffer exists from the stream that, um, and I'm not actually sure. I believe it was sometime shortly after 2010 where it w was amended from a 30-foot buffer to a 50-foot buffer. I'm not. I'm not sure when that occurred. But the 50-foot buffer today, um, coupled with a T dot right of way, which um, I believe is 58 feet of the property effectively takes the property from 1.6 acres of sort of actionable, developable space um, down to 0.43 acres. Um, that being said, um, it is not in the floodplain to my knowledge, and it is also, uh, we've also presented a, a mitigation plan which um, is substantial and um, you know meets all the requirements. Uh, the, working with staff to, to provide it, um, size of caliper trees, number of species, uh, et cetera. Um, and so today we're, we're asking for your consideration for uh, the preliminary variance. Um, and again, here to answer any questions that you may have. Is there anyone here from the public speak in favor of or in opposition to the request? Seeing none. A discussion among the committee. I have a question. So um, you're gaining access to your property from an adjacent parcel, uh, it looks like, through a private drive. Is that correct? Yes, sir. So does the, does the, is the adjacent property owner is the same person that owns this property? No, sir. So how are you, how are you, how are you getting an easement or, or use of the private drive? It's, it's through a vote. Through what? It's through a vote uh, of the, of the, um, the owners association. Okay, so there's a process that you would have to go through in order to... Indeed. Okay. Which we have begun. Okay. I'm, I'm going to hold on that thought for a minute. I'm sure. Just everybody else, and then I may come back. I would do ask. So what's, what is the use on this adjacent property? What is the use on that adjacent parcel? The adjacent property mm -hmm. is Mill Creek Town Center, which comprises of um, a Kroger shopping, a Kroger um, uh, immediately adjacent is a McDonald's, there's a Taco Bell, there's a Regions Bank. Behind the McDonald's uh, is a HCA building. Um, adjacent to it is a tire, sh tire store, and behind that is Goodwill. So are, are all those properties uh, owned individually? Uh, is the area outside of those like a common area, an open space, or? The only areas that are common areas are the drives. 
Uh, so what about the areas adjacent to the drive, the open spaces, the, the spaces that aren't built on, uh, the grassed areas? Individually owned. Individually to, owned. To, to my understanding today. So the property that would be between the drive and your property right now is individually owned. So you'd still have to have an access from that point across to your site th through someone's property. Um, ex so if you can see on this plat right mm -hmm. here, that area directly in between, I believe is it, that is not individually owned by anyone that is owned by the association. Okay. That, that wh which is the point of access. Okay. Just my initial observation would be that if you're gonna negotiate an access, you could possibly also negotiate property or a real line, a parcel line, which would probably provide you a little more space that you don't have right now. Um, because right now, I mean, you're encroaching into these two buffers. And I think we would have a hard time determining what a hardship would be for something like that. Is that a fair statement? Dodd or? Are y'all paying attention to me this no, morning? I <laughs> um, I got okay. I'm sitting in my chair. I'll, I'll, I'll admit I, I got a text from my wife. Okay, it's, it's all right. The sorry. second one I've gotten this right. morning, so she really wants to talk to me. Oh, <laughs> but I mean, here, I mean, we're looking at hardships here, right? Can explain to me one more time what okay. you want well, to do. Well, I was just I was I looking at the plan. You know, I'm saying that there's some space that's you know between this drive and this site, which you know maybe you could utilize that space to to have less encroachments into a buffer. You know if you could acquire it or negotiate it or whatever, uh, you can maybe even have your point of access in a different location as well. But the site plan, as I look at it, and as I understand our our uh, charge, is that there there needs to be a hardship, and. I don't know that I see a hardship here because you're developing the property. You've more or less created a hardship, right? So, um, I may have one thing to add to yeah. that to help clarify sort of um, the owners' association is a is a is an interesting case. It's effectively um, disbanded, and there is no there's no longer a board. So. Effectively, what we need to do, and this is part of what we need to do to gain access, mm -hmm. is to contact each individual owner. We need to gain a 50% majority vote to gain that access. Um, the avenues for acquiring property, I'm not, to be honest with you, legally, from a legal standpoint, I'm not sure how that would occur. Or it could be easements, it could be access, you know, it doesn't have to have a building on it. I, I'm just looking at it and I'm just thinking there may be a way to re design this and soften the request because uh, I think that in looking at this unless I'm mistaken so you've got paved surfaces within the zone two and the zone one buffer and I think getting into zone one buffer is going to be a particular problem for you you know based upon our, our past and so um, those are just observations this is just a preliminary and so I'm just providing you with what I see and what I would be looking at. And I think each individual member here would probably may, maybe give you different viewpoints, but that's mine. Just a question back on that regarding zone one, which is, is it um, make a difference to the committee that it's pervious versus impervious? We area? generally don't grant variances within the zone one. I mean, rarely, rarely do we do that. And I mean, rarely we would have, we would allow impervious surfaces in the zone two. Um, so I, th I think you're probably, um, it may be easier to get that, but for just, just again, generally from my perspective and what I have seen, going into the zone one is a particular problem and you need to avoid it. Yeah, and it, it's, and, and, and scale, you know, you would think would matter, small scale versus large scale. This is a pretty large scale intrusion you're proposing. We've, we've consistently denied even small scale intrusions into the zone one and zone two. Um, uh, you don't have a lot of room for mitigation here either on site. So, um, you know, my personal read is that, you know, we have buffer protection for a reason. That's a publicly due process purpose variances um, that erode that public purpose at this scale um, are are really hard to get and so uh, we, we don't want you to waste a lot of time uh, 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 billable time investment time you know opportunity time for the next project you're working on working on something that has a lot of intrusion into a publicly purposed buffer ordinance so 
Steve, like um, the the, um, the zone one buffer, is it bounded by a floodway? Is that what that is? Or is uh, this like a stream buffer? No, sir, this is just strictly a stream buffer. Okay. Uh, it was alluded uh, back in 2007 when the development first occurred, we did have a, a before that was a 25 foot buffer, but we also buffered 40 acre drains. Uh, after the 2007, we, we upped the buffers from, uh, since this drains over uh, 100 acres, now it's a, a two zone buffer. It's just um, unusual with that, that jog in the line there. I'm, I'm having a hard time wrapping my head around why, if this is such a large tributary or large drainage basin, the shape of the, of the, of the it's, it's just barely over 100 acres. It's not much more than 100 mm -hmm. acres. And right under Nolensville Pike is the Walgreens. And right behind the Walgreens is the Mill Creek floodplain and Mill Creek. Um, so it, it's, it's almost right there. So the shape of the boundary is based upon the shape of the, of the stream itself. Uh, for, it's, it's just unusual right. to me that, to see this little <clears throat> jog in it like that. And I just didn't know if that's something that could be corrected or reevaluated re or looked at. I think uh, based on what they find today, if, uh -huh. if they find that you guys are warm, I think they'll probably go back out and get a, a much better survey yeah. and, uh, and, and have a better defined channel. Right. I mean, because that to me also, we're just trying to be helpful here. Uh, to me, that seems unusual. And the fact that, that that protrudes out like that is causing you to encroach more into a buffer. And so uh, if, you, if you decide to proceed or, or look into this, I would look into that to see if, if there's a, a legitimate way to smooth that out. Uh, can I add one more thing? Mm -hmm, sure. You may want to look at the, the, the package presented okay. before you versus what we have on our screen. Uh, it should probably be a little bit more exact, and I think the jog is less severe in that spot. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Is this part? Is this property part of the association? This next to you? No, sir. I think that it's, it's a very valid question as to the approach because they've got property over there they're not using, and these lines. Never would. Yeah, and um, and I, I, there very well may be an opportunity for you to purchase uh, property uh, at a very reasonable cost. Um, that opens up a lot more space for you for this property. Um, the, ex the existing location of those lines and how they built it were kind of driven by existing. That's wasted space. And uh, it seems to me um, that um, there's an opportunity here uh, to pull your development out of the, the buffer. Um, and which is something we'd first want to look at prior to granting any buffer intrusions. Um, I think a as, as presented today, uh, my vote would, would be to deny uh, and, and not vote in favor of the variance. Uh, but I don't think that, uh, that f uh, necessarily foreshadows a future vote that maybe uses the property in a little bit better way. That's helpful to you. Yes, thank you. And just, just for additional clarification, if we were able to rework some things and per perhaps adjust the, the, the property boundary line, but it only prevented us from, or it only allowed us to uh, stay out of zone one, can we get a feel for, you know, I think today we're proposing uh, 38, uh, 3850 square feet in zone two. If zone two was still encroached upon, can I get a feel for? Let me give you my experience, it tells me that you've got about a 50-50 shot at that. I think your, your shot at getting into, getting into um, the, is which one don't we allow, is it zone one? So, right, I get them confused. So zone one, I think your chances of getting a variance there are slim to none uh, under, for this use. Uh, zone two, you know, someone may have a bad day and may have a headache when they're in here. And my experience tells me that you're looking at about 50-50 shot of zone two at this at this use. So there's a chance. So the number of spaces. <laughs> it's like the movie Dumber and Dumber. So there's, there's, there's a chance. <laughs> so there's a chance. The number of spaces that are shown in this plan, I guess that's a detail area. Is that what those are, all those spaces? Because there's a lot of parking spaces here. 
Is this they a drive-through facility? Which car wash? Is that what this is? Yes, it's an express. It's an express car wash, and those park uh, uh, the parking area is dedicated for um, vacuums. Detail, details, right? Okay. So is that the number of spaces that you would normally be required to have? It's, it's significantly less than what we would do on a typical site. Um, mm -hmm site plan and another another challenge that we have is metro requires a um, we could add parks and effectively try to reduce the number that is on the let's call it the buffer side of the of the drive but due to um, a, an, another metro requirement which is to have a drive a, a pass through lane which we're showing mm -hmm. on the plan mm -hmm. um, obviously that takes away some from that area and um, you know, one of the thoughts that we have often is is a pass through opportunity. There's there's you know vehicles can still pass through the building. The 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 wash equipment can effectively be turned off, and a car can be um, sort of corralled through the the tunnel. But that's another issue, and I think uh, perhaps another committee. So I mean, uh, back to the point again about negotiating. I mean, you could theoretically negoti negotiate the pass through on the opposite side and not have to you know, go back towards the, the tributary. But I, I just think that if you do some a little redesign here, I think you'll be in better shape. Can somebody show me a picture of what the buffer looks like now? The quality of the buffer, the density of the buffer. Do we have any, we have any on-site photos on ground? A Google Street View. Uh, I'll, 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 I'll preface this while they're looking by saying that you know um, sometimes you can enhance the zone one to offset some encroachment in the zone two. Sometimes you can use previous paving in the zone two. Uh, I, I know we've had some cases of this scale that have had occasional intrusions in the zone two where they just or they needed to finish out a parking lot to, to reach a certain to reach a certain parking space density, or a, a continuous in, intrusion is, is a little more challenging. Like the chairman said, there's a 50/50 chance, roughly, that you know that the committee will see that as too much of a of an intrusion. Uh, but you can certainly um, uh, increase your your opportunity to to get a a more um, mitigated impact by um, enhancing the zone one and using stormwater friendly practices in the zone two where it's, it's just really difficult to stay out of it. So the best rule of thumb is just to try to st stay completely out of zone one, try to avoid a long continuous intrusion in zone two and just try to have the occasional intrusion in zone two and mitigate both, so. Uh, Commissioner? Uh, in, just yes, to be a little bit clear, <clears throat> the, re the required water quality is being taken care of by the bioretention area in the center. Their mitigation they're proposing is that they're going to do pervious pavement where it's not required, in addition to some plantings that you'll see on L1.0. So you're already headed in, in a reasonable directions yeah and they and again that was at staff's kind of uh, guidance and 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 you know I don't know if that this might help us for future you know um, um, meetings but it, it, can the any comments be made to that that mitigation plan as we've I mean is there is there anything additionally we can do versus what we submitted with that plan um, it, I felt it was you know, fairly robust, and again, that's just uh, going to be comes come down to us as much as we're, you know, in the buffer. I understand that. I just, you know, if there's anything else that we can do, we're we're willing to consider. So you recycle your water, I'm saying, right? Yes, it is. So explain that process to me, how that works. We're very green friendly on all of our sites. We have a site about three miles down the road. We use solar panels. We recycle all of our water. Our chemical is drinkable, although you wouldn't. Um, you know, so all of our water is recaptured, reprocessed, and reused. So what do you do with, um, 
uh, it's separate, I guess there's dirt, there's some kind of sediment at some point, what happens to that? We have a company come out and pump the tank mm -hmm. about once every three to four months and carry that sediment off. Okay. I think we approved a similar practice to this, yeah, a couple years ago. Uh, mm -hmm. There was a blue beacon truck wash. Truck wash. That's what it was, a truck wash. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that was interesting. Yeah. Um, I'd like to make a motion to deny the request. You guys have heard enough. A second. Is that what do we, do we, is that what we, we do, do on a preliminary? We make a motion to approve or deny? Is that what we do? The committee doesn't take any action at all unless they do it through so. a motion. Oh, so. uh, yeah. really? So mm -hmm. we just hear and talk and move on? Uh, no, no, no. I meant um, unless you do a motion, you will not have done anything on this request. So we, we have to do a motion is what you're saying. Okay. Oh. So I was right. I You're to, right. I'm yeah. just, I don't know. I'm just making sure. It just right. seems harsh. We, we did have some questions about that, and maybe early on in the practice of doing preliminaries, we didn't do motions. So I think there's been okay. some confusion. So right. there, there was a motion and a second. Can I, can I ask one last question? I'm sorry. Yeah. All, all, these, all that's happening, you know, is that he's, you're, we're making a motion based upon more or less what you submitted to sure, us. Sure, and I'm okay. just wondering if, for the record, it may be of any benefit for us to just defer um, with no, the knowledge that we have. and. Mm -hmm. Just avoid a negative recommendation today. I don't know if it makes a difference or not. Just a question. I don't know if it makes a difference. I, I guess you're allowed to request it. It's yeah, it's your option. Yeah. I think we'll do that. All we'll right. It's been a defer request to defer. And I think we do vote on the deferral. Is that correct? Well, you're deferring indefinitely, correct? And I, it's, it's, if yes. we make a motion to defer, do we need to say how long we're deferring? No. Is, <laughs> Ideally, if, it, if, it's, if it's something other than an indefinite deferral, if you want to specify the time period, you would okay, need to so, do that. So if we defer, we're just saying it's indefinite unless we s s indicate otherwise. Is that Greater correct? clarity is always better. Okay. <laughs> it, it's All quite right. interesting that this is a preliminary going for a deferral. And <laughs> I think the idea, I think the background why we started the mm -hmm. preliminary was to give the applicants a better feel of... Um, I, I think, and I don't want. I don't want to say no, don't go no, for a deferral. No, no, no. I think he's. I understand just from a philosophical perspective is that they don't want to have a, something on a record that says disapprove. I understand that. So, so I would. I would. I would just defer this indefinitely. You've already made a motion to defer. I've got a request to defer indefinitely. I'll make a motion to grant that request. Can I hear a second on the second. motion? We've got a motion to defer indefinitely. Is there any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Seeing none. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. If the applicant wishes to come back, we'll continue to work with them at staff level and try to get them to a, a better spot. Wonderful. That's always preferred. <laughs> All right, let's move to the last item on the agenda, at least the request agenda. Um, I'll need to recuse myself on this. Is there something we're discussing after this? I noticed we had that. We the, have anything uh, on the agenda? Are we going to discuss this? Um, what, did I, what did I see here? I think you were going to discuss it. Is this just here for our, for our? The case. I think the thought was that we've got less on our agenda I am next I'm sorry, y'all. I just was checking the rules of the committee. Before everybody leaves, Hold on, gentlemen, could y'all stand right? Yeah. Sir? I, I apologize for not um, spotting this timely enough, but um, uh, there is a provision in your rules that says, at the conclusion of the evidence in all cases heard at the hearing session, the committee shall discuss the cases and render decisions in executive session on that date or defer decisions for no longer than 30 days thereafter. Right. So they would come back with another preliminary? Or? Uh, well, I think that the, the rule's not the written. Rule. The rule's not written in... in, in, in the rule was written before preliminaries yeah, started being done. Okay. So, so, so given, given, that, given that fact, uh, I'd like to make a motion to rescind uh, the last motion. Okay. Yeah. Second motion. That. Can okay, get a vote on that. Second. Yeah. All in favor of rescinding the last motion, say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. So that motion rescinded. Now I'd like to make a motion to grant a 30-day uh, deferral. Uh, anyone second that motion? I'll second it. No, we've got a motion on the floor to grant a 30-day deferral. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. So you, thank you very much for pointing that out. Now we have a 30-day deferral, and now uh, you guys have a good rest of the week. <laughs> <laughs> and so now back to my question. On, on the uh, Court of Appeals that you have here on Precision Homes, is this something we're going to discuss? 
I think not, I'm going to leave. Yeah, I think the thought is we're going to discuss the, that case next week. I mean, next month. Is that right, Terry? Yeah, I'm sorry. The, the, the case, the, the, the Precision Homes case, the thought is we're going to discuss that next so, month. So, uh, yeah, we put it in the packet. So um, the, the issue was just that we had five cases on the agenda for today, and okay. Penny had kind of taken a look at that and said, hey, maybe we should put that one off for September. Okay. Um, but the thought was we'd give it to you in your packet, give you your chance to look it over and read it in your own time, and then we could have a substantive discussion of and, it in September. And I won't be back. That's what I expect. Yeah. Sounds All good. Right. All right, we've got a recusal from Mr. Dale, and um, then we're going to hear the th last matter on the agenda. Were you guys here earlier when the opening statements were read? You were not, Michael. Okay, so let's let's go ahead and read the opening statement again. All right, this is the opening statement to the applicant. If you are not satisfied with the decision made by the Stormwater Management Committee, you may appeal the decision by filing for a writ of certiori with the Davidson County Chancery or Circuit Court. Your appeal must be filed within 60 days of the date of the committee's decision. You are advised to seek the, um, seek the independent advice of legal counsel to ensure that your appeal is filed within a timely manner and that all procedural requirements have been satisfied. Thank you. With that, we'll turn it over to staff for an explanation of the request. Case number five on the agenda is case number 2019-00010, uh, Glastonbury Road at 450B Glastonbury Road, APN 107-0000-6600. Inspectors Donald Irves, Council District 13, Holly Hueso. Applicant's request is to allow the following 340 square feet of impervious area and minor grading within the zone two buffer. Appellant is Craig Porter, CNS Properties, TN, LLC, 2019. Represented by Michael Garrigan of Dell Associates. Comments, stormwater staff had no comment provided, codes, no comment provided. Planning, site is zoned, RM20, defer to stormwater for review. Greenways defer to the decision of the stormwater management committee. Thank you very much. With that, we'll turn it over to the applicant. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Michael Garrigan, civil engineer with Dell & Associates. Um, I'll start out by saying we fought tooth and nail to stay away from this variance request, and um, it's just a, it's a very challenging geometric site. Um, it measures about two acres. It's owned RM20, so it's entitled to 40 units. Uh, however, we're proposing 17. Um, over 50%, 55.8%, little over an acre of the site is stream and stream buffer. And we're, in, we're asking for a physical encroachment of 340 square feet of just front sidewalk, um, which equates to less than 1% of the stream and the stream buffer, which seems like, why couldn't you avoid that? And trust me, we really, really tried. Um, through working with the other various metro departments uh, for parking, with to have all the utilities in the drive. We just got pinched at that one location. We even turned the front stoop sideways along the front of the house as opposed to having the steps coming straight out perpendicular to the channel to minimize to the most extent possible any disturbance in that zone two. Uh, the zone one will remain intact. That's where the, the tree canopy exists. Uh, primarily, we will um, mit our mitigation for the 340 square feet that we're requesting is uh, 38 new canopy native species along the zone one buffer um, and some along the zone two buffer. Um, and again, this is simply for front door access to three of our units. Um, we. We can just go through all the discussions of why are we here, but I promise you we tried every which way but loose to um, to avoid this and and not um, have to be here, but just the way this property shaped, the way the buffer comes into the property, um, this is where we landed, so thank you. Thank you. Uh, anyone here from the public speak in favor of or in opposition to this request? Seeing none, uh, discussion, questions from the committee? Okay, just for the record and for clarity, um, just remind us exactly how much of the zone two is being encroached on square feet? Uh, 340 square feet for okay. the sidewalk. Okay. I don't have any other questions. What's the green? 
And so green is grading. Uh, it, okay. it's, it's ground cover, which is permitted in the okay, zone Okay, so the two. only encroachment uh, is this little sidewalk area uh, in, in right the orange, there. Yes, sir. brown, tan. That's correct. Okay. And the green is just you've got to do a little bit of grading to get your site to work. That's correct. And that's usually allowed in zone two anyway. Yes, sir. Okay. At staff level. At staff level, yeah. All right. Um, I think this is a great use of the site, and I don't. And I'm going to go ahead and make a motion uh, to approve the variance request. Um, I'll second it. And there's a second of that motion. So the motion is now on the table, and we're all got open for discussion. Any discussion about the motion to grant the request is. Thank you for trying to avoid it and for what you did. Seeing none, let's put a vote to a question to a fa uh, vote. All in favor of the, uh, the motion say aye. 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 Any opposed? None. Thank you very much, guys. You have a good day. Um, that is all the matters on the request agenda. Uh, there's nothing on old business uh, based on the um, number of matters we're going to hear today. Any, anyone need anything to bring up? Seeing nothing, uh, I'll make a motion to adjourn. I'll second it. There's a motion to adjourn. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. We are adjourned. Thank you, guys. Thank you. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.org.